or you have any challenges getting, say, us to name stuff correctly? Um, if that stuff is in flux? Um, not really, because a lot of the names, um, well, I mean, there's learning names every time we introduce something new, because everybody had to go back and re-export all the rooms, like with the occluder meshes, for example. Um, but it's pretty simple. You just go in and create an extra mesh and re-export it. There wasn't a lot of post-processing, which really helped that. Um, but as far as the naming conventions of the geometry within the room, the visible geometry, that was pretty much up to the artist. I mean, it wasn't really, it didn't have to be a standard. The other things, the debug meshes, um, were all the same throughout. So once you make one room, you know, that was it. You know, you had the occluder mesh and the collision mesh and this and so. Um, maybe you mentioned this workout, but it wouldn't matter to keep track of it. In the folder code, you can just pull up the spreadsheet and say, okay, well, I know this texture's area, and just look up four digits are added to the name of the max, and then it's done. So just a follow-up question, would you say that um, the artists work with were fairly technical artists? Uh, not really, because um, it, it was just a matter of, um, we had some new guys start, and it took them a couple of weeks to get ramped up, but um, no, it, it, it takes you through kind of a presentation like this, saying, okay, this is what a room is, because it is pretty unusual to have all these weird debug meshes and things like that. Um, and that's mostly just because we wanted that client server model, but we wanted to look as next gen as we could, you know, with normal maps and spectral lighting and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. Are there a portion of enhanced artists to make sources? Because you mentioned that you use the Yeah, um, in source versus outsourced. <laughs> in house versus outsourced. For backgrounds, the actual concepts themselves, the building, the streets, roads, um, all that stuff was done in-house. Um, the props themselves, we outsourced um, to probably half of those, um, especially the bigger ones, the cars and things. And those, those, we just gave them designs, hey, make the tank and it looks like this, and most of making a good looking tank takes a lot. So um, we outsourced that. The characters, they outsourced roughly 80% of it. Because once they did the prototypes and had it, the way the textures work and the components and everything, um, they outsourced all that. And then we did all the animation in house because that we constantly tweaking that engine as well, how things pull in together and all that. Um, most of the weapons were done out of house, and that we started right off the bat. We had a couple weapons in house. So okay, well, we just need designs, and so we ended up with hundred odd unique weapon uh, models and meshes. And now it's just a matter of having good documentation to show the contractors, okay, this is where. You have to have four mod slots on this weapon, and it's going to be a machine gun or a you know, fire bolt launcher or something. And the, what would you regard as a large resolution? So, like in terms of the resolution that we've now used for this? We, um, the characters are 2048s um, for the diffuse and normal, and then I think they step it down for Spectre. The backgrounds, it was really scaled to what it was. The road pieces were um, our 2048s, because it's such a big piece of ground, and, and real scale, like it says, it's 20 meters square. And so you want to look decent when you're actually standing there. And then the buildings themselves are 1024s for pretty much all the side, because that's you know, usually further away. Um, and it, it just all scaled, basically relative to real world, scale based off of a road 20 by 20 and 2048. You talk a bit about the process of uh, iterating between uh, the design layouts and how much time you spend on creating each of the files and the art itself. Does that not have to be a amount of work just tweaking up the stuff? Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I won't deny that. Um, but that, it, it really, you know, I was used to that somewhat from the work in the Gala days, but our lead designer is uh, Eric Schaefer and Dave Revick, and the, the original Gala idea, and they, they just like to work that way. They like to be able to make a radical change at any time. So everybody in our office has to kind of be prepared for that. <laughs> um, but that's what, knowing that going into this project, I decided to make things as simple as possible and you know, not have to rely on too many people in the food chain to make a change. Um, and all, I think a lot of the basics stayed the same. Once we had the general scale of the room, size it didn't change much. And you know, a lot of the later tweaks had to do more of a technical thing, just like putting includers in. Because a lot of the gameplay stuff is just controlled by the size and the randomness of the level, how many twists and turns it takes, and if it's confusing. So, so you did it a lot, but it was pretty fast. What's that? So you did it a lot, but it was pretty fast. So, like it was fast to do the change? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, to, like, for example, we went from uh, having one main station and two substations to having eight main stations and an extra town. Um, but having built one of those towns, 
I rebuilt that town to kind of make it formulaic, and then I rebuilt the other seven in uh, about two months or so. So I mean, that was a big chunk of the game, you know, because it all centered around the towns. And so it was just a matter of coming up with a way to build it. So at the end, it took me probably three or four days to create a town at the Temple Station there, uh, just because I had all the parts and pieces and scale nailed down.